This is me, the Undead Viking. About a year or so ago, I think I'm really bad with timing, uh, but uh, I got contacted uh, out of the blue uh, by a designer that wanted me to take a look at their game. It was called Hexplorit, um, the Valley of the Dead King. And I took a look at it and I was completely and totally blown away. I just absolutely adored the game. Um, it was just... <sighs> It, you know, it was it, it was one of my best games of last year, and um, you know, it's just like it, it just came out of literally came out of nowhere. Like you know, this you usually I mean it, it hit all the cylinders for me. It was it was a it was a narrative fantasy themed game. Um, it had you know like all the classic tropes that I really like of like you know having events and different encounters and having to battle through those encounters. And they weren't just battles either; they were like tests and puzzles and things like that. And it was just fantastic. And it went through Kickstarter and it got published. And I just recently actually got my Kickstarter version. I was super excited. The game looks amazing, plays amazing, and it's awesome. So when the designer contacted me and asked me if I wanted to take a look, ugh, take a look at the next version or the next like sequel of it, and this is the Forests of Adramon, Hexplore It, um, I said, yeah, well, why are you even bothering asking? You just send it to me. I want to play all the stuffs and I want to check it out. So um, I got this and um, it, you know, if you've played uh, the, the Valley of the Dead Kings or if you're, and if you're familiar with it, or if, um, like you watch my preceding video, um, this is going to be more the same. However, they do change things up as far as like the, the world that you're running around in. Uh, it changes things up as far as like um, what your tasks are. And, it, and, it, and it's, it's different enough that it feels like its own separate entity, even if like the mechanisms of the game are still based in what you probably already know and recognize. Um, regardless, uh, you know, I knew I was going to love it. I love it. It's awesome. Um, I'm going to show you how the game is played, show you what the game looks like. Um, it, this is going to be kind of a retread of the old mechanisms, and, and not completely, mind you, but it's going to be a retread. Uh, but it is different enough that, like I said, it, it does spin some things on its ear a little bit. And the, and the awesome thing is, is that you can actually use this uh, in conjunction with Valley of the Dead Kings, and you can make super big epic games and stuff like that, but I'll talk about all of that uh, later on, probably in my final thoughts. So why don't we go over um, the Forests of Adramon, and then we will come back here and I'll give you uh, my final thoughts about Hexplore It, and, and, and this version, and just the, the game system as a whole. All right, cool. All right, so this is Hexplorit, the Forests of Adramon, and like its predecessor, uh, Hexplorit, the Valley of the Dead King, this game has a lot going on. It has a fabulous uh, background story. Uh, basically, um, this evil sorceress uh, um, like has is starting to corrupt um, this, this, this forest of Adramon, where all of these cities are and people lived in peace. And unfortunately, uh, what's happened is, is that, you know, she's corrupted it and she is stealing the minds of the people that live there and the heroes themselves almost you know were had their minds stolen and had themselves corrupted uh by the evil but they've just managed to escape and now they're they've taken it upon themselves uh to go out on a quest uh to you know destroy the sorceress and return the valley uh, to its uh, to its normalcy now, along the way, um, they're going to encounter a lot of different uh, adventures, some combat, some events, and what have you. And it's going to have a unique story each and every time that you play. Something that I really, really like about this game. Now, the actual gameplay, I'm going to show you some of the things that you can do in your turn and talk about some of the, um, the, the aspects and the mechanisms. But there's really no way, if I'm trying to be succinct, that I'm going to be able to touch on every single aspect. So I do invite you to go ahead and check out the Kickstarter page and read the rules for yourself and so you can kind of dive in and you can uh, take a, a deeper look uh, after you get done watching this video. All right, so what you're looking at here is the starting map. Uh, you're looking up here. These are these um, different circumstances. And when you think circumstances, think in adventure. You know, something uh, random that could very well happen to your party as they travel about this area. Uh, down here, you have four relics. You do get more than four relics. There's a couple extra cards there. You randomly have one of these four relics. And then 
your goal here is to, um, one of the goals, you don't have to do this, but it's going to help you out a lot if you do, your goal is to reforge these relics so you can have these items of power. And the way you do that is by going on specific uh, adventures that these cards, there's two cards in each of these, and, and you'll, you know, as you get through them, you'll get more cards from this deck, obviously. Uh, and if you uh, complete those quests and, and or complete uh, those trials that they give you, you will get uh, par shards of the uh, uh, the different artifacts here. So like this is uh, Kel's greatsword or Kajal's greatsword. And so you know, I actually set these aside so you can see that um, the greatsword itself like has these three fragments. And you can see that, like, it actually shows, you can kind of tell the different areas of, of those. And, you know, as you collect those fragments, once you get all of them together, then you will be instructed to go to one of an old battlefield and you'll actually reforge it. I mean, this is, like, really in-depth, like, D&D &D campaign stuff. As a matter of fact, I mean, as I played this game and kind of read the background, I was, like, just stealing ideas left and right, putting them in the back of my head for the next time I run a D&D &D campaign, because I really, really liked how they were doing this. Um, but regardless, uh, when you place these destination cards on there, and you, this is all randomly done at the beginning of the game, mind you. Um, if, like, this card here, like you can see, and I'll just show you one so you can kind of see what it says. So it's uh, navigate. Uh, the snow in the mountains uh, turns to raging streams in the spring. You've located a beaver dam holding back the blasting water. And this is going to go over some mechanisms that you're not going to understand just quite yet. So just keep that in mind. But just I wanted you to read this. Um, to make the dam stronger, the beavers likely used a fragment they found in the riverbank, but retrieving it would flood the area. If you tear down the dam, roll the the, the, the six-sided die. Next turn is your entire movement. Your group moves half this amount down the river. Cautiously. Remember that word, cautiously, there, because I'm going to come back to that. Um, challenge. Instead of destroying the dam, all heroes may sacrifice three energy to sa safely extract the fragment without flooding the area and may move normally next. And so then you're going to get some rewards. If you get a critical success in solving it, you get a bonus. And so there's the fragment. So, you know, that's just like, it's not always going to be you got to beat up the goblins and take the stuff. There are going to be things where, uh, you know, it's just a decision that the party's going to make. Now, I should also mention this is a party. So each player is going to be in a party at Adventures, and you're represented by that, that that figure right there. You don't branch off and say, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna head over to that uh, corrupted city and see what I find. Okay, I'm going to head over that way and see if I can find the troll cave. You, you, you all stay together, and as a group, you decide what you're going to do. All right, so since I mentioned the party and I mentioned the players, I'm going to tell you how you make your characters. So you, you can discuss with the other players how you want to make characters all you want. Each character is going to have, like, just a, a, a character class. You know, even, you know, the druid, the historian, the verdant keeper, the solipsist, the warden, and so forth. So after you pick one, so let's just say I took the Stormcaller. After you take your... your uh, your character now you have to get and and you can divvy these up however you want i mean you can do it randomly uh you can um you know like you every rolls a die and then first person gets to pick that blah and so on and so forth it doesn't really matter but then each person um will get a race and once again these races there are many of them as you can see uh the races are just that it is the the like, you're not only a Stormcaller, let's just take the top one off the deck, you are a Wood Elf Stormcaller. Now that's important because there are going to be, like, adjustments. So, the Stormcaller, like, has uh, an attack value of 3, right there, a defense of 1, um, this, it, their first mastery is a 2, and their second mastery is a 1. So if you look at the Wood Elf, it'll actually tell you that it gets a plus 1 to attack, nothing changes on defense, First mastery is plus one, second mastery is plus one. They get a plus one to navigate and plus one to explore, and they get plus one health and plus three energy. And they have a food rating of two, and I'll explain food rating here in a second. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a little Sharpie here, I shouldn't say Sharpie, a dry erase marker, because as you probably uh, had already seen, the, the character sheets are laminated. So to start with, um, you can see it has a six health, but he gets a plus one health, so you just would write on there. So he's got seven health. He has six energy, but it gets plus three energy, so you just wrote down nine energy there. 
He gets a plus one to attack, so we're going to go ahead and make that a four attack. The wind wall doesn't change at all. The scorch gets plus one, so you add, make that a three, and the freezing rain becomes a two. And these three down here, plus one navigate and plus one to explore, so three to navigate, two to explore, and this stays normal, uh, the survival. And so now, like, and you notice how you can also have, like, a name and so on, and a favorite opponent, things like that, that you get to, like, flesh out your character. Once again, making this game feel like you're playing D&D &D because of the fact that you're, like, coming up with, you're not, I mean, there's lots of games out there that, like, will give you, you know, Vexus the Stormcaller or whatever, you know. You can just come up with whatever name you want, kind of making uh, the the character yours and yours alone, right? And, and so it makes it kind of neat. Now you also, if you want to use these, you can get a trait. And traits are abilities that just kind of break the rules a little bit. So like if you just take the top one up, it says it's aggressive. Now you might notice, and this, this you know, the, the hex is going to be in a lot of different things here. So you start off with like, you know, nothing, but um, as far as your trait goes, but as you increase, like if you do a certain thing with here, it says reduce an opponent's health to zero. If you do that, each time aggressive heroes gain a rank in aggressive, they may choose to permanently reduce their defend rank by one and increase their attack rank by two. At rank six, they deal piercing damage while using their attack ability. So like piercing damage can't be defended. So. You just have, so now, you know, I have, you know, like, you know, you know, Roger, the, the, the Wood Elf Stormcaller, but, like, I can come up with a backstory, because he's aggressive, he just wants to see his enemies in the ground, maybe, maybe his family uh, has been mind wiped, and he thinks he's lost them, and so he's just on a, a, a mission of, of, of death and, and, and destruction, and so he just doesn't care about his defense, he just wants to go ahead and, you know, destroy, destroy, destroy. Once again, making the game feel like it's a D&D game, like a campaign game. Um, so anyway, uh, after everybody gets their character put together, uh, they're going to get three dice, um, and they're going to get one of each of these colors. Depending upon, uh, like, you know, what, what happens, you're going to be rolling these dice a lot, um, and just for the different actions, because whenever you... Uh, Whenever you move, you're going to end up rolling these dice because of the fact that you have to check um, your navigate ability, your explore ability, and your survive ability when you move. Also, other actions will actually ask you. So, like, like here's like uh, the, this pristine of uh, pristine Glen event, and it actually you can see it has the blue die down there. So it's going to ask you to roll. Um, uh, you know, uh, use one of those dice to, uh, like, you know, to determine whether or not that works. But we'll talk about circumstances here in just a little bit. Now, the big thing about uh, uh, dice is that, now, it's through lots and lots of games that I've played, I'm, I've just ingrained myself into higher is better. Roll high, roll high, roll high, right? You just, you get into that, so it's like, if your skill is three, roll d6, and you add three to that, and what do you get? Is it higher than this target number? You gotta throw that mindset away, <laughs> because um, this game is all about rolling below, rolling lower than the skill level. So if you have a skill and, and or an ability of like you know four, and you need you need to roll underneath that, and then you yell and you know there are all and so like lots of times you'll find like an item or an ability that will say minus four to your roll, and like your gut reaction is gonna be like oh that's awful, but. No, minus 40 your roll is actually really good because it's actually going to help you succeed in your roll. So um, just something I wanted to talk about real briefly to kind of explain how that works. All right, so how does a turn work? So the turn works pretty simply. Um, the players decide where they're going to move and what they're going to try to accomplish. Now, usually what the players are going to be trying to do is they're going to be trying to get to different areas of interest that will allow them to do explorations and will allow them to better their party in some way. Now, if you move your party ever to the edge of a board, you know, like this, at that point, you are allowed to draw another tile and add it to the board. Now, you can't go, you, you have to draw randomly, and so you can see it has E through N on there, but you are trying to get, like, here's, like, uh, a bounty that's an end bounty, because it needs, to, you need to find, you know, this card uh, to, to be able to get 
the, uh, the, the destination token placed on the board so you can go and investigate that particular spot. So, uh, and, and when you add them, you can just add them, however, let me move this and I'll talk about those power-ups eventually here, just a moment. But when you add a, add a spot, you just add a spot like so. Now, if you can't, you, and you can make it, you can put it on there however you want. There's, there's nothing uh, that says that you have to put it in a certain uh, direction or, 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 or destination or anything like that. Um, you can you just place it, you know, so you can turn it and you can kind of like, you know, make it fit or whatever. There's no rules about like roads having to match up or, you know, terrain having to match up. You just go ahead and place it however you want, and you can travel forward on it. Now, I should mention that you get a bunch of these little tiny tiles that kind of add to it. You can add those on there to fill in fill in spots, or if maybe you don't want to add a whole whole another tile to it, you can definitely add those on there however you like. You don't have to draw these randomly. You just pick those as you as you will. All right. Now, since I actually drew this one, let me just kind of show you a couple of quick things so you can see on here. Um, so sometimes you'll find on the board, you'll find an outpost. Outposts are places where you can go and you, if you've earned gold, you can go there and purchase things. Uh, you can purchase food, you can purchase uh, items, things like that, that will help you in your journey. A lot of times you'll find spots that are like this, and that means it's a boss area. You might have noticed that there's already some boss areas that are out there, including one that is covered up by one of our uh, uh, like uh, destinations that we have. Uh, and you might have also noticed that there's this kind of weird like little like uh, Druid's Grove symbol there. Now the Druid's Grove symbol is represent it represents this. Uh, so, um, and this is the area where there is a like a, a Druid that is still trying to fight back and trying to prevent um, the uh, the incursion of, of the evilness of the magic. And if you can get to her and you by by finding these locations, um, then you can go there and you can trade um, gifts of the wood that you'll find in your adventure. Uh, you can trade gifts of the wood to her for different bonuses. And I'll show that to you in just a little bit. One of the things that you have to have though, in order to do that is one of these circumstances up here has to have one that exact same little uh, icon that's on there. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's just because it's, you know, the, the druids are able to hide um, their uh, their locations from you. And and so and they basically won't let you in unless you know you can find like they unless they let you. So it's it's uh, something where you like you it's, it's it's just kind of a random thing the fickleness of of the druids and, and the fickleness of their magic and so you have to make sure that you have a card up there that has that all right so okay let's let's actually get back to how a turn works so when you decide to move you have to decide a couple things now if you move you notice that there's rivers and there's roads if you move along a road or a river the entire time, you can move up to four spaces normally. If you move along a road or a river the entire time, you are considered to be moving cautiously. When you move cautiously, you gain a couple of bonuses. One of the big things is, is that um, if you don't want to engage in uh, the random event that you pull, uh, then you don't have to. You can just discard it and it doesn't happen. I, uh, thematically, you, you see the trouble ahead, you avoid it, you go around it, what have you. If you want to travel overland, like so, to move cautiously, you just can only move one space. Uh, and, you know, so, and then you can fit it. Now, if you're moving overland, a normal amount of, of, of spaces, you run the risk of possibly losing your way. Uh, and that is like, you know, and that's why your navigation skills, uh, you know, have to be rolled. And, you know, like you can see down here, you can see like navigate and like I have a three in that. Now everybody's got a navigate skill and everybody will roll navigate and then attempt to basically try to make sure you stay on task. If you fail, what you'll, what will end up happening is that you will roll a D6. You'll notice that there's this little, uh, area there and you will wander off in a random direction after your movement is done uh, and perhaps like end up going someplace that you don't want to go. 
Now I should mention the navigate is just one of the three different skills you're going to be rolling each time uh, you have a turn. Uh, and the other skills that you can roll um, after uh, you roll your navigate. And I should also mention that if you ever roll a one on the die, it's considered to be um, like, a, like a critical success and you'll get bonuses for doing so. If you roll a 10, it's considered a critical failure and, and no matter what your skill level is. If, even if you have a 10 skill uh, and you roll a 10, it's considered a failure. So an explore, if you succeed, in the, that's the yellow, if you succeed on your explore skill, you gain two gold worth of treasure during your turn. You just basically like, you find some treasure as you walk around. If you explore roll fails, uh, you uh, get nothing but dirt. If you get a critical success, uh, meaning you roll a one, during your skill phase you find an excellent place to camp and each hero will regain a lost health or you can find an infused seed and an infused seed is one of those nature's gifts that the druids are looking for um, that you can attempt to harvest at that point. Um, and everybody can roll that. It isn't just one person rolling that. Everybody can roll that and gain that ability. I should mention that to avoid wandering, uh, more like half of the players rounding up have to succeed on their navigation. So if you have four players, two people have to succeed. If you have five players, three people have to succeed. So you can see where having a good navigation is important. All right, so survival is the last one. If you uh, you roll, you succeed with your survival, uh, you forage in the wilderness and you don't have to come up with any food. You don't have to spend, eat any of the food that you have. If your survival roll fails, you have to consume food from your inventory uh, equal to whatever your food rating is. And then if your food rating is zero, uh, you obviously are going to begin starving. And starving obviously is bad. Now remember, you're a party, so other players can give you their food as well. Uh, but you know, if you're starving, uh, you will slowly lose energy, you'll lose health. And if you starve three turns in a row, uh, you will end up dying. So try not to die. <laughs> it's important to eat uh, to maintain. And nothing, nothing's less heroic uh, than the, the brave adventurers starving to death in the middle of the forest because they can't seem to roll well enough. So after you've um, done that, you will roll a circumstance. So when you roll a circumstance, you roll a d6, and notice that it's one, two, three, four, five, and that will determine which one you're going to deal with. So in case this is the circumstances we're gonna deal with. Now, if you roll a six, you draw one randomly off the top of the deck, unseen, not knowing. So this one happens to be an event, and the event just states that uh, it's unavoidable, and it says a pack of enraged pixies wish to make a giant's elixir in order to grow bigger and drive away the cruel trolls that have taken over their home. Uh, they steal an essence vine from you in order to create the elixir. An essence vine is one of those nature's gifts uh, that you find. Um, if the party doesn't have one, each member suffers two health damage, getting a first taste of the pixie's wrath. Of course, if the heroes happen to have a giant's elixir they're willing to share, they instead gladly take it off their hands. That's the entire event. I mean, that's one of those things where it's like, ah, well, you know, uh, p make a choice, pick one. Now, uh, I'm going to actually use this event because it is a combat. When I show you combat here, like the owl bears, um, it's a magical nature uh, enemy. And so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be using this one to show you combat here in just a little bit. Uh, but, you know, obviously there are combats there. And then there's also just uh, like events that are that, like, so this, this hidden cairn. Uh, you find a mysterious clearing full of wild magic. The air is serene and somewhat heavy. Uh, each person rolls an explorer. For each hero that succeeds, the group receives one essence vine. If at least half the heroes succeed in the explorer roll, the group may also draw a card from the fragment deck. So, you know, that'd be awesome. I, you know, you know, good time uh, to have everybody roll really well. And, and so, and remember, if you move cautiously, um, you can, uh, if you you can choose to discard the circumstance played. Um, you know, you manage to avoid that dangerous circumstance. All right, so then. Uh, you need to settle an event. Uh, so events occur if you're on a waypost, an enthralled city, uh, a battle site, um, if you happen to be in Elowen's Grove, the Druid's Grove, um, if you're on a boss spot, or a destination location, you resolve the event. Uh, so the uh, destinations, you go through the action. Remember like the beaver dam? You'd go through that particular action with the beaver dam uh, in that spot. 
uh, then if you and then enthralled cities and battle site, I'll talk about those in a little bit uh, because they're an entire different board that I have to show you. But bosses, um, you will have to fight the boss, and bosses are pretty tough fights. And you know, like a level one fight is going to be a lot easier uh, than a level nine fight. The level ten fight is the sorceress who is sitting in her throne right there. Um, so let me actually show you uh, those other boards so you can see like just what the other, uh, like, location things that will happen there. All right, so, uh, so if you go to one of the cities, you can see there's cities in those different locations, um, you go to an enthralled city. So you, and I'm not going to go through this whole thing, uh, but what will happen is, is that you will decide if you're going to, like, split up and search, if you're going to explore as a group, and, you know, and then you're going to roll uh, your roll the dice to see how many successes you get. You notice how you roll all three of your skill dice and you see how many successes you get. Depending upon how many successes you get, uh, you will you will gain uh, like gain certain like uh, possible like gear and also different things and then you roll a fate die which is the d8 that's right there and so you can see like uh um like if, if you roll well uh you will be able to so like exploring this group if more than one hero searches together the hero with the most successes consults the table to the left on behalf of the group and for instance if the best roll of the group is a two full successes um the group will receive a minus one bonus to the fate die result and each hero would gain two rolls on the gear table so um the fate die will determine whether or not you run into any trouble that's in there so like if you get in so like you can see the member the lower is good you can see these modifiers are minuses and so, uh, like, it's like, you've been lucky. Uh, the group has avoided a confrontation. Discard the first event or treasure card located in the circumstance bar. Or, uh, like, you, you just uh, have, like, it has been a long and tiring day. Only a few encounters of the mind wipe today. Roll the six-headed die. Each member loses that much energy. And so, as it goes up and further, and so even worse and worse things, you've been cornered in the situation to die. Each member loses one rank in each skill if you, like, roll really, really poorly. So, obviously, the cities are dangerous. But... Then you get to if you succeed, you're going to be able to roll for gear gear upgrades and for items and loot and all kinds of things. And I'm like I said, I'm not going to go through a whole thing, but the cities are great locations to grab um, lots of you know equipment and to outfit yourself and increase skills and things like that. But they can be dangerous. So I just want to show you the Elements Grove. You have a giant list of stuff that you're able to purchase depending upon if you have seeds or or you know vines or hearts of the forest which is like the largest possible uh like nature's gift if you will and so if you have those things like even there's that giant elixir that uh that the, the they were looking for if you have those things then they give you all these little descriptions of what they are and of course then if you buy those you write those down on the on the uh you, you write those down on your uh, on your player board that you that you have those things, uh, and uh, I'm just going to quickly show you this. Like th there's dark relics um, that the uh, that the, the the druid wants you to bring, and if you can bring those, she's going to give you things, and also it, show, it gives you the rules for harvesting nature's essence, and so how you are able to you know get those like nature's gifts to give. All right, so here's wayposts. <laughs> and so this is where you will spend your gold. If you go there, there's all kinds of cool little um, trinkets and things like that. Stealth boots, trail maps, moon root, you know, all kinds of stuff that you'll be able to use in your travels that are going to help you out. And once again, this is one of those things where it's like this is a really in-depth, like highly involved uh, story and highly involved like adventure. Um, this is not like uh, I, I really I really like uh, the, the attention to detail that we have here. So here we have uh, battle sites, and depending on like this is where if you're on a battle site, uh, there's sacred locations uh, where the brave heroes stood against the magi. Um, you don't have a circumstance in a battle site. And then so you get you can you get a healing surge, um, you can forge relics there, and then you can gain favors and what have you. And again, this is just another you know, large uh, aspect of the game that I just you know for, for to be a little bit succinct, we're gonna like move forward. So anyway, so just remember that this is your story and this is your adventure. 
and um, you don't have to follow the same path each and every time, and that's kind of the fun of this for me that I've had, is that um, I've attempted to, you know, go about a, attaining victory in many different ways, and I find it to be fun when, like, you just do something different each time, and then, and, and grow that, that, that story, grow that narrative in a different way, uh, in, for that particular, uh, you know, play session, if you will. All right, so, uh, finally, I just wanted to show you some of the boss cards. So, the boss cards, um, from, like, Marekkek, the Troll King, uh, you know, oh, not that one, all the way to, and here she is, you know, uh, Adramon the Magi. Uh, and so, each one of these, um, has their own powers and abilities and difficulties, if you will. And you'll notice that, like, you know, she has, like, the, the 120, uh, health and, you know, and, and, and energy in comparison to, say, you know, the Troll King, you know, has 20 and 18. And I should mention, uh, before I, you know, dive into, like, uh, the bosses here and just real quickly, I should mention that, um, at the beginning of the game, you should, you'll have one person that'll have this battle mat. And, um, what the, this will be is, this will, uh, like, be a way that you can keep track of everything that's going on in your particular, uh, game. Uh, one of the big things is this, this turn tracker up here. So, this is, uh, the, the power of Adramon. Uh, and each turn, you will, like, fill in one of these little squares, uh, with your dry erase marker. When you fill in all six, you will put a one in this location, and then you'll get to the next one, and so on and so forth as the game progresses. Each time that you have a one, like, uh, if that number is greater than the skill ranking of a player that they have, they're unable to use that skill because she's literally like sucking uh, the that, that ability out of you, out of your brain. And if you ever get to a point where all of your skill rankings are lower uh, than this number, you are considered to be mind wiped at that point. And if you end up next to uh, one of the cities, uh, you are you are uh, consumed basically by by like her power, and you're dead and out. Um, you know, so just <laughs> obviously not a good thing. So um, so this is the, this isn't a game where you can just rest on your laurels. It's going to move forward. And also, as this increases, she will start sending out her sentinels, and these sentinels will go out onto the board and will start tracking you down and start attacking you. And they are not easy to. to defeat either but all right so uh, the big thing about this is that you're able to use this board just to track whatever you want and most importantly you'll use it to track battles which you will write with dry erase marker here also uh you can say you see here that there are ways the game difficulty will affect like certain things like if you want to play you know starter you don't change anything but um you're going to, if you play it on easy difficulty, you're going to increase the health of um, the things that you fight by plus five uh, vitals uh, per hero that you, that's playing. So, like, if you had four heroes and you see everything would have plus 20 to their, their uh, health and energy, um, and they do extra damage. So, um, you can scale the game up if you so desire. All right. So, anyway, uh, putting that down, uh, I would, oh, yeah, I want to talk about the bosses really quickly. So bosses are interesting, and I'll, I'll, when I show you combat, you'll understand how, why this is like something that's interesting about this. Bosses, when they attack, they have several different powers of the ability. Notice, power of the gray skull. Yeah, that's awesome. Anyway, um, so they have uh, these different powers and abilities that they go through. And, um, and I like how this is like kind of, it isn't just rolling a die and like, oh, he did six damage. Okay, go. Okay, he did four damage. Okay, you go. This like kind of actually makes it kind of interesting. It's like, where are my underlings and a bolt of fire and things like that that are like, that make the combats descriptive and fun. And once again, adds to that narrative. All right, so combat. Combat is, uh, you know, going to happen, and it is, and it is part, definitely part of the game. But you can fight relatively few combats other than the boss battles, and um, you can pull off a win just because, just through exploring and what have you. But the big thing when you do a combat is this number up here will kind of tell you what level the combat is, like how how difficult, you know, per se, the combat might be. And it'll also tell you, like, the health and the energy 
of, of, the, of whatever you're fighting. And then it will tell you that when you're fighting it, you'll have roll a d6, and like on a one to two, it'll uh, um, it'll it'll do four damage to the group. On like a three or four, it says group health and energy, and one target is frightened. And like, I, and there's a big giant chart with all these different um, like effects, like that will occur to different players that they'll have. Um, that you know, uh, that and you can once again, if you want to go check out the rules, you can look those up. But anyway, so and then finally, like the uh, five or six, the the hex is six, uh, single target health, and the target becomes disoriented and confused and does four damage now this ability and this ability don't cost any energy to do this ability does take energy if you roll that and they don't have any energy you would just revert back to the basic attack all right so the way combat works is that each player will look at their their uh their character and they will decide you know what they are going to do um they're going to declare your hero action so if you know you're the storm caller you might say you know what i'm just going to hit it with a lightning bolt that's that's going to be uh that that's going to be my intention and everybody says that now there you don't have to actually technically say what your target is um but in a lot of cases you really only have one but you don't have to say you just say that's what i'm going to do and then uh, you will roll a die to determine what the opponent actions are, and then you just resolve the combat. Um, so when you attack, but like you can attack like the energy uh, of, of of something, uh, and you also can you know obviously attack the health of that thing. So. Something to mention, though, about, about any attacks or defends or if you're going to do, like, uh, like either of your masteries. Now, masteries cost energy to do. You can see that by looking at that little icon there. Uh, they cost energy to do. And they actually, you can see there's big, long uh, explanations as to what they will, how they will affect it and what they will do when, they, when you use them. But uh, you, for the most part, these just work. Like if you decide to do a lightning bolt, it just does four damage. If you do a wind wall, it defends against one point of damage. It just does that. If you have a heal, it'll just heal that amount of damage. The same thing goes for the attacker as well, the, your opponent. And all of the stuff happens simultaneously. So if you roll this, and this one does four points of damage to group health, meaning that everybody's getting hurt, then everybody's getting hurt. You know, and, and so, but then that's where like your your defense and things like that will come in handy. And you can like apply it, and different, different characters will have different abilities that you can use to help out the group. And this makes the combat really, really tactical because of the fact that like you all can look and see you know what the monster can do to you and you can say okay well these are the different things that could happen how are we going to possibly defend against this that the other thing and what what can we hope for and so different actions and different abilities will come into play and you will uh like you'll bet on certain outcomes after you figured out what's going to happen and like the resolution comes, that's when you can start picking what you're going to attack. You know, you can attack the thing's energy, so it can't use... And energy attacks, obviously, in a lot of cases, are much more useful when you're attacking a boss in some way. But, you know, whatever reason, you know, like, it is a very, very strategic way of handling combat, but also in a way that it actually resolves really quickly, because it isn't something where you're fumbling through a bunch of cards or anything like that. You're not going through a bunch of uh, stuff trying to, like, you know, uh, like, you just, like, roll 17 different dice to try to determine exactly what you hit and how much damage you did and what have you. Combats can flow very, very quickly, and, you know, and they're pretty much to the death. There are rules for running away, but for the most part, you're in it to win it. Now, I want to actually show you one kind of uh, uh, a bad guy, if you will, and I got to find one, of course. Um, but some of these creatures will be soul laced, and that that what that symbol right there means. When you run into a soul laced creature, um, basically they have kind of like a shield around them, um, protecting them, and you've got a you've actually got a you know, knock them down twice before you. So you got to knock through their 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 soul shield, which is the equivalent of their health as, anyway. So it's like basically having to get through that twice to be able to you know uh, actually start doing damage. You have to actually knock off their shield before you can actually do damage to their energy or their health. So uh, that's that. Now 
when you win a combat, and I'm going to say you win the combat, when you win a combat, you will get awards. And so, and these awards will be, um, like in this case, you're going to be getting nature's gifts, and you're also going to be getting food for winning the combat. And so, and those will be given to everybody in the group. It isn't like a single situation. Sometimes if you win, like, if, you know, for, and this isn't just for combat, some combats will actually give you um, these, like, big giant bonus cards. And these bonus cards will, like, give you, uh, like, you you know, big giant skill bonuses like this, or, um, you know, they will, like, you know, to, like, even there's ones for, like, masteries, there's ones that increase your health, so anytime you have a situation or a combat that can get you to draw one of these cards, try to make sure you get that, because those are a big deal. All right, so ultimately the whole point is, is that you're, you're going to be cruising around this map, you're going to be, you know, leveling up your characters, and it isn't really leveling up, but you're going to be bettering your characters through equipment, through power-ups, and through relics, and what have you, until eventually you're going to go, and you're going to go ahead and face uh, the big, bad Adramon, and you're going to face her in one-on-one -on -one combat. If somehow you're still alive, and the game, and your counter here uh gets up to 10 she will just come to you <laughs> and if she's if, if, if you've actually lasted that long and you're still around then uh, maybe you'll have a shot but i'm guessing that you've had either probably have attacked her already or uh you know uh you you you're, you've been destroyed by the fact that her power is so great and you haven't been able to get your skills up to that point and you've just been weakened and in which case she's probably going to take care of you anyway um this is a game that is difficult uh you are especially when you can ramp up the difficulty of the of the of the uh the level of the game you know i would suggest when you first started play it in starter but then you know if you win you know slowly increase the difficulty up up, up the chart and see how well you do uh it, it is it but win or lose this game succeeds for me on just the fun and the narrative and the story that it tells me and the fact that like the time just seems to melt away as i'm playing it. and i just it, it's one of those things where you know i blink and, and i realize i spent the last three or four hours with my friends um, playing this epic game when we you know play on these like super high epic levels playing these epic games and there are actually rules to play real long marathon games and you can actually you know tie this into the valley of the dead king so you could play both of those at the same time but i just it's one of those things where i i well i i, I this is this is this is as close as i've come to like playing a DD game uh, at my table without actually playing D&D. But I'll talk about that and more uh, in my final thoughts. Oh, jeez. Well, oh, whoops, there we go. There you go, the forests of Adramon. So, all right, so like I said, you knew I was gonna like it, you knew I thought it was gonna be awesome, and so yes, it is cool and it's awesome. And I mentioned something at the end of the gameplay portion about how this was, this is, for me, the closest that I've come yet uh, to playing a D&D game that isn't a D&D game. Like, uh, so, like, we always, people want, like, so Dungeons & Dragons, it's like, it's like, it's, it's, that's my bread and butter. That's, that's the thing that I look forward to. Every couple of weeks, my gaming group gets together and we play Dungeons & Dragons. I look forward to it. It's, it's my Saturday night of just being able to be my character and, and enjoy that moment. And I look forward to it and I get excited for it every single time that that time comes up. And it is really, really tough to take the openness, the, 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 the boundless adventure, the aspects of Dungeons and & Dragons, and actually really convey them into a board game. And in, in, in a lot of respects, you shouldn't even bother trying, I, honestly, because of the fact that it's just, it's just if you're going to try to get that into a board game, then just play Dungeons & Dragons, right? Get the people together and play it. But for whatever reason, there's lots of times when that's just not going to work out. Maybe you don't have somebody who's willing to put the time and effort into creating like the story, the the, the, the dungeon, so to speak. And, and you don't have a game master that's willing to run that for you. So games like this try to replicate that. And I shouldn't say, I, I don't want to put words into the designer's mouth. I don't want to say, hey, this is my Dungeons & Dragons board game. I don't want to say that. But... For my money and for my time, this comes the closest of anything. And as you can see, like all these descent boxes in the background here, um, you know, I've played dang near every single dungeon crawl board game that's out there. And, and some of them have been really, really good, and some of them haven't been really, really good. 
and some of them have been freaking amazing and this one is freaking amazing and it is the closest that i've come i enjoy the whole narrative aspect of it i like the fact that i actually have a character that grows and and becomes more of themselves and they have a story behind them now you don't have to play it like that but for me i do i come up with a narrative i come up with like a whole purpose of the different like i last time i played it i was the historian so i came up with a whole backstory of this person that you know he was just basically a scholar and a librarian and never really thought that you know he was ever going to be an adventurer or anything like that but when you know the, the the people around him were getting their minds sucked out and they were going blank he realized he had to do something and then like as he was holed up in like this little secluded sector of his library he saw the other party members of the group and they were racing out of the city trying to escape and and he grabbed like, like a few books off the shelves, things that he thought he'd need, and he ran out with them. He wasn't a warrior. He wasn't anything. He was he was wasn't meant to fight, but now he was going to fight. And he was going to try to save the world, and that for me is fun. I like coming up with that little backstory. I like coming up with that extra reality, if you will, uh, for the game. Now. I suppose I could do that for other games. I suppose I could do that for Descent and stuff, but it doesn't It doesn't feel the same. I don't feel like I have a big open area to travel around in these games. This is literally, like they say, it is Hexplore it. It is, you are going to be crossing the country. You're going to be finding new lands. You are going to be discovering treasures and artifacts and running into monsters and having encounters. And you have giant decks of these encounters that you are going to go through, and you're not going to get through all of these over multiple play sessions. I mean, theoretically, if you played this 10, 12 times, you might start getting like some repeats and you'd say, oh, okay, this is what that is. But tell me a game that you play 10 or 12 times nowadays. It just doesn't happen. Uh, you know, I just, if you dig like the fantasy themes, if you dig like the idea of sitting down and going on a quest with your friends, or if you just want to play this game solo, you can definitely play it solo and have a blast with it. You're going to really, really enjoy this one and, and, and as much as I do. If you are a child of the Dungeons & Dragons 70s like I was, I think this one needs to be on your shelf. And even if you aren't a person of those D&D &D 70s, you need to have this on your shelf. As a co-op game, it is fantastic. As an adventuring game, it is fantastic. As a narrative-themed fantasy, you know, save the world game it is fantastic and um if you and if you own uh valley of the dead kings you pro uh valley of the dead king dead kings if you own that you're gonna want to own this one too so there you go uh if you have any questions about it please ask away i'd love to talk about this one if you think that i've missed out on some like other like uh stump me try try to come up with a game that i haven't played that that's like the like a, a fantasy dungeon crawling adventuring board game that i haven't seen but i'm pretty sure i played most of them if not all so all right awesome uh thank you very much as always for taking the time to watch this video uh and as always you have yourself one heck of an awesome day all right bye-bye